Well, hello there YouTube. So this is going to be the start of another Rembrandt master study. Of course, as you're used to, we're going to be working in a very direct manner. So I'm just going to be drawing with raw umber. The difference is you're watching this as a pre-recorded video as um, I guess the last like two months or so I was doing a um, live stream format. So as I said, I'm going to switch around from here and there from live stream to pre-recorded. So the Rembrandt that we're going to be working on, uh, this is an image from not Google Arts and Culture, but this is from the National Gallery of Art in the UK. So the photo reference is linked in the description box of this video, and I highly encourage you to paint along with me. So definitely paint along with me with this one. This is going to be a, another long-term painting, so I'm just trying to figure out the placement of the head and if you want to see the uh, finished version of the most uh, recent Rembrandt master study please check out my Instagram which is also linked in the description box down below and if you're wondering what I'm doing with my hand if this is your first time uh, watching this I usually just use the use my hand for like a measurement so the head is, or the face at least, is roughly the size of my hand, which is kind of true to nature for most cases. I mean, uh, depending on the model, the length of your hands, I mean from the pinky all the way down to the thumb, is basically kind of close to life size. Just a little under life size is, I guess, what we're going to get with this one. So I'm just following the silhouette. I'm wondering how much of the environment that I want, that is like how much of the hat and stuff that I want in here. And it starts off very simple and abstracted. So I was saying if you've been watching the uh, watching this YouTube channel for a while you, you kind of have a, a sense of how it starts. It's kind of simple loose and rough straight lines and angles. And so the reason why I've been doing a lot of Rembrandts is that I have chosen Rembrandt to be the, um, let's just, just say the main motivational artist, I guess, the, the main influence when it comes to the style, or not just the style, uh, the, the approach that I want to have in painting. Now obviously I'm not claiming to be painting just like Rembrandt. I'm not claiming that this is how he started or anything like that. Uh, this is merely just a study. And each one of these studies makes me a stronger painter, I believe. So I'm using just Winsor Newton Raw Umber. I'm drawing with a fairly used up size 2 uh, Filbert bristle brush and when I erase, I'm going to just erase with uh, paper towel. I like to use Viva brand paper towel. I'm working on a 9 by 12 inch aluminum panel that has been toned with oil paint. This is basically just raw umber, a white, a little bit of black. It looks very much like a skin tone. That's a rough guesstimation of the silhouette. Obviously the ear is going to need to be adjusted. And the main thing I'm focused on right now is just the placement. Now since this is pre-recorded, you're not going to see every brush stroke involved in this, so it's not going to be super long, but you're going to get the gist of it. And please don't mistake this for an online lesson. If you're interested in online lessons with me, please check out my online classes. And the link to that is of course in the description box of this video. 
Now, so if you're curious about any information that I don't talk about, like the materials, uh, my classes, or the photo reference, or anything I forget to mention, please check the description box. And since this is just raw umber, I'm just locking this into place a little better. So since this is just raw umber, I can easily just go in without gloves. But whenever I get into color and if I have to move things around like this with color, I would use gloves since I do use lead white. So now I'm going to switch to a different brush. This is a size six, extremely old uh, Princeton Catalyst poly tip bristle. A little bit of Gamsol. Sometimes I'll use Spike Lavender as my solvent. Other times I'll just use Gamsol. I'm just using Gamsol this time. And I'm looking at negative shapes, so like from here to here, it's not as wide. Now obviously it would be best if we were working at a museum, if we were working from the original painting. But since that, that has a lot of difficulties, uh, technical difficulties involved in it. Uh, this is the best thing we can do, learning-wise. Uh, this is much, this is much better for learning purposes than looking up like a, a random photograph of like a, of, you know, like it not taken in the best, you know, the best conditions, the best lighting conditions. So if your interest is in your interest is in learning. This is the best thing for you. So with raw umber, it's kind of nice. Um, depending on how you use the brush, see how this is a little more scratchy? So depending on how you use the brush, you're gonna get a different value. Not that I'm trying to get too many values at this point. If I was trying to get a lot of values, that would be a mistake. Uh, I'm just using the, let's just say, the pressure of the brush. And you'll see a little trick here. I'll subtract somewhat. So little tricks like this can help me get kind of an idea of a, of a different value. Not that I need it yet. I don't need too much of it. This is just to help me guide the shapes is what this is. And it starts off pretty abstract. In the beginning, you wouldn't even, you know, this is your first time watching or something like that. You're, you're probably wondering, you're, you're guessing if this, if this is really how it's, how it's done. And for the most part, for most classical schools, classical ateliers, this, this kind of simple and easy start is whatever, almost what everyone uses. Now, uh, if you're wondering why I'm working on an aluminum panel instead of the usual linens that I work on, no reason in particular. I just kind of felt like it. Though you could argue that since this Rembrandt, it's titled Rembrandt at the age of 34, at this point in his life, Rembrandt was doing a very finished looking paintings, uh, less of that kind of um, expressive brush mark looking thing that you you see and more of the later Rembrandt so it's gonna have quite a an intricate resolve it's gonna get really tight 
at some point. Not today, obviously, but at some point it's definitely going to get very, um, very detailed. Let's just put it that way. So working on a smoother surface is ideal for that. So the hat, uh, the hat is actually, when I squint down, the hat is going to look like his hair. Uh, because I'm, I'm grouping together the uh, shape of the hat with the hair. So when you're at this stage of the painting process, just make sure to squint down. Squint down and unify stuff. Unify the darks. See, pretty soon, uh, excuse me, so pretty soon I'm gonna just kind of sketch in some of the darks on the face without too much worry for detail. Now, just like you're seeing here, depending on the brush stroke, depending on how I apply the paint, I can get a different value. But for now, I'm trying to keep that to a minimum. Obviously, some spots like this are a little bit of an exception, but it's, it's being kept at a minimum. And this is the most important step in terms of the composition of this picture. Even though it's cropped, right? I'm not showing all of all of the painting. It's important that the simple basic light and dark patterns, these big patterns, the silhouette, it's important that this works. So I'm gonna look at the top part of the painting. And it's important that it works. You have to kind of picture it what it's going to look like in its frame. So this is a, let me just cover all the way up here. So this is a um, aluminum panel and all the surfaces that I work on, I'm going to adjust this clip, all the surfaces that I work on tend to be very um, archival. So rarely are you going to see me work on something that's not very archival. So. You know, um, it's, I just like the feeling of knowing that whatever I'm painting, whatever I'm working on, is going to last for a long time. And obviously this is not going to be, you know, cherished as a, as a Rembrandt painting would. I still like to know that whatever I'm painting is going to last. Now when you thin the paint out with Gamsol, the way that I'm doing here, it's going to sink in to the surface eventually, so it's, it's going to look lighter. Mysteriously, it's going to look lighter after like 30 minutes or one hour or something. And that's just because I'm thinning out the paint. Kind of roughly put a little blob here for where his nose might fit.
and it starts to take on kind of a charcoal drawing look charcoal aesthetic the more that you apply the paint guesstimation for where the mouth is eventually going to go. They're all just educated guesses. So I'm going to scribble some paint in the background right now just so I can get another sense of value. But don't be mistaken, this is only for the sake of making the drawing, making the drawing more apparent. Remember that a drawing is a series of corrections, so whatever looks off with outlines looks really off if you have multiple values. So this is just to make the mistakes look more apparent to the eye. Like I said, the negative shape. So you can compare this negative shape to this negative shape now. This one is much, much taller. So this is starting to become some of the fur. Now it may look kind of like a ghost at first, and if it does look kind of like a ghost, again, it's not so much of a bad thing. It means you're starting to get the impression of a human head. So far so good, so we're just throwing shapes out there and we're working with them. So as I always say, if 
you keep your shapes simple and easy, that's good. I usually say keep your shapes simple and easy so that when the time comes to make changes, those changes are simple and easy to manage. And in general, wh whether you're working with oil paint or with acrylic or with watercolor or gouache or digital media or you're making a painting out of hamburgers, whatever it is, it's generally easier to work from simple to complex. So try to see the big rhythms, the big shapes first. before you get caught up in minutia. The more experience you get, the more experience you have in painting, the, the more you'll be able to see what doesn't need to be put in right away. And it doesn't always have to start the same either. Sometimes I start by putting in more stuff. So sometimes I start with drawing the details for the uh, eye socket and things like that. Still not putting in, you know, like hyper detail or anything like that right away, but sometimes the patterns are different. So uh, one thing I don't want you to, to think is that just because this painting is developing this way, that it must always develop in this sequence of events. It doesn't have to be that way. You will find your own pattern. Uh, so the shadow of shape comes down a little more. So I'm looking at this negative shape now, just looking at this. And this is a nice departure from the quick and easy does it nature of the world th these days. For some reason everything seems like it has to be done quick. Like a la prima or right in the moment. I guess we have Instagram and, and all kinds of social medias to thank for that. So take this as a time to have a more, I want to say, uh, dedicated study to the art of painting. And at this point, now that the face is starting to get some stuff into it, obviously not finished, anything, nothing is finished here, but now that the face is starting to get some more information, it's important to let you know that the camera angle that you're looking at, the camera is at an angle with respect to the canvas or to the panel. So this is going to look longer to you than it actually is in life. And it's at an angle because this is a 90 degrees eye level to me. And I always recommend you work at 90 degrees. Why is that? That is so that you don't have a lot of distortion when you're looking at your painting. So remember, keep the painting that you're working on at a 90 degree angle and keep it 
arm's length away from you at eye level. Do this and I promise you, you will get better. You will get better at painting. And if you've already been doing that, good for you. You will keep improving. I promise you. Okay, so now at this stage, we're going to start to add more specificity. And I'm going to show you one thing to check that is generally true for most cases, depending on the likeness of the model. It could vary, and depending on perspective, it could vary. But usually, you can check the thirds of the head as the forehead. The forehead to the eyebrows is one third, and the eyebrows to the nose is another third and the nose to the chin is the final third so since the uh, hairline is blocked by the hat we can't use that one so the other thirds that we can use are the eyebrows to the nose and that's usually to the bottom of the nose this distance should roughly equal the distance all the way down to the chin and it does so that means we're in a good place. So now we are in a good place to start to move stuff around. Another thing you can check are the height to width ratios. So for example, the entire head from the shadow shape down to the chin, run it across. Should it meet exactly with the ear? I don't think so. I think it needs to get a little wider so I can check that on my photo reference. Obviously you can't see that from where I am, and they don't. It's actually a, a little bit wider, so the ear should probably go out to about there. So that's another measurement that you can check and use to just make sure that the big shapes are in proportion with one another. So I'm gonna move this back a little further, which is gonna make the ear look large, but if it's a change that has to be done, it has to be done. So again, from the shadow shape down to the chin. And you can always find a unique pattern or a unique measurement. So it has to definitely go a little further. So you can always find some kind of pattern like that um, with whatever subject matter, whether it's a figure painting, uh, portrait like this one or still life you can always find little patterns like that and right now the ear looks huge it looks monstrous but that's just because we're adjusting it so I want to keep this point as far out as it is. Now obviously the earlobe is going to move. With the movement of the earlobe, the tragus of the ear is also going to move. And everything is going to get just a little wider. So the eyebrows are going to move. This collar is going to move. It needs to be further out. So what did I tell you? Keep your shape simple and easy. Had we put all kinds of detail on the ear, it would have been a pain to move. Now the ear roughly matches with the eye, so that's good. So that's a much better placement 
that, than we had before. Obviously, we're going to still have to move stuff around, but you get the gist of it. So now we can start to add some some information for the features. Just using the same color, the so raw umber. I'm going around the structure of the eye socket. Again, please do not confuse this with one of my online lessons. I don't usually move this fast. I'm looking at the structure of the eye socket. So once again, you can use horizontal and verticals. So the edge of the eye should just roughly be at the bottom, just at the bottom of the uh, of the ear, of the top part of the ear, the helix, anti-helix area of the ear. Now we can start to guesstimate the eyes. Again, I'm moving the brush strokes in this direction just to reduce glare. Now pay attention to the angle of the eyes, so his eyes are slightly angled. Constantly, I'm constantly sitting back. So I usually prefer to stand, but I'm sitting at the moment. So remember, keep your shapes simple and easy. The nose goes out, I want to say almost on a vertical, it kind of meets with the pupil, just like we have there. There's a cast shadow of the nose. on the side of the philtrum. I always go for a more triangular cast shadow from the nose and less of a rectangular. Just for the sake of aesthetics. Among other things. Now Rembrandt's nose is wider. The bulb of his nose is much wider. It's 
so in the outlines I want to make sure that that's apparent. The form shadow of the nose. The form shadow edges are usually softer than the cast shadow. Remember a cast shadow is just a projected shadow. The word cast. Uh, we can run another check proportionally. So the tear duct roughly matches the corner of the nose on a vertical. And we're good with that. Okay, so next we're going to walk our way down and start to place the mouth. So think about this distance between the bottom of the nose. So first I'm just going to sketch in the mustache. So think of the distance between the bottom of the nose and the top middle portion of the upper lip. The top middle portion of the upper lip goes about there. Bottom of the lip goes about here. And I tell you, the more I do this, the more stuff I see that I have to adjust. So as you put more information in, previous mistakes will become more apparent. And the corner of the mouth just goes a little bit past the plum line of the wing of the nose. Do not get caught up in detail for the features just yet. One thing I'm definitely sure that I'm going to have to move is the forehead. Now the eyes are correct relative to the features so far, relatively correct. So now we're going to go back to the outside shape of the face. So you're going to see this kind of pattern. So first it's the outside shape of the face, then it's the eyes, then the rest of the features. Then we go back to the outside shape and then we adjust the eyes. And that cycle continues until we have the light and dark shapes as perfect as we can possibly have them. This shrinks the size of the, size of the face, which is fine. It's just something that happens. So it's good to try to aim for life size. Had I made the face smaller, that would have been much more of a challenge. So like I said, it's a good idea to unify whenever possible. So squint down and unify. So what's nice about this change is that, that, is that it's going to move the hat. 
So now the hat's gonna look more like a hat than it did before. Pretty neat. So it's a mistake that ended up helping us out a lot, actually. And this is something I almost always get wrong for Rembrandt's hats. I usually just kind of forget about them until later. But for the sake of the composition, it's uh, something I'm considering more with this one. So I did add a little gamsol to the brush to make this look darker, but don't worry, it's going to sink in just like this has sunken in. Now you can see what I'm talking about. So gradually this got lighter. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just gradually move stuff around until it becomes closer and closer to the, uh, the exact light and dark patterns. So I've been starting to refine the eye a little bit, so I thought I would record this part so I can explain what I'm, what I'm doing. So I'm using a, um, well, this is like a very cheap round uh, acrylic or watercolor brush that has had paint dry on it. So this is relatively new. Uh, I didn't quite use this um, this method in the past but it just seems to be working. And it was just by mistake I ended up letting paint dry on this brush and then I found that it's a really nice precision eraser. So what I'm doing is I'm using a brush that doesn't have dry paint on it to apply paint. So this is a uh, size 5 Sable, size 5 Pure Red Sable Silver Brush brand. So remember, the tear duct must match up with the nose. So in fact, if the nose, the wing of the nose is here, we're pretty much at a good place. And again, I'm using the photo reference to check that. I am going to have to move the tear duct slightly. And by slightly, I mean uh, maybe what, like a centimeter or so there. So I'm going to have to move it right there to about that point. So I'm just going back and forth with the eraser brush, which is this brush here that has had paint dry on it, thus making it a stiff uh, brush. And I'm using a clean, well it was clean before, but now it has wet paint on it. Uh, this is a sable brush. So once again, the goal is to get the light and shadow shapes 
as perfect as possible. Right now the eye is a little bit large. So I'm going to have to adjust that and I may use uh, here and there, I may use a dry bristle brush, more like a large eraser. This is a clean, well it was a clean bristle brush and this works really nicely as a larger eraser to push stuff around. So I have a large eraser and I have a precision eraser. I have a small brush that I can use to apply paint and of course the larger brush that we were using earlier. Now the eye is getting closer to the correct size. So yeah, just thought I would show you uh, what I was doing there. So let's go ahead and uh, skip ahead to where more information has been added to the drawing. And so after some time has passed, some more drawing improvements have happened. So basically just using the same materials as before with a couple of additional materials. One is this uh, just like large, uh, very fine hair brush that I use, use once in a while to try to make the try to make the surface a little bit more smooth. The next one that I used was just a synthetic brush just to blend out some edges here and there. So what this is basically is just the drawing with raw umber and it's already gotten to the point now where it's starting to dry. It's getting very tacky, which is good, which means that it's going to be completely dry and ready for the next layer. So that being said, I hope that this helps you out. Uh, I wish you the very best in all of your artwork. And if you would like to take online classes with me, please check the link in the description down below to my online classes. Remember the link to the photo reference used for this is also posted in the description box down below. Again, I wish you the very best in all of your artwork and I'll see you on the next one.